Yeah, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me, but also for uh, running this event, because I think it's a vibrant community. And I want to take you now onto a journey that shows how the data that is collected in PDB and the algorithms that are developed to analyze it uh, can be really put to practice into improving, hopefully in the long distant future, uh, chemotherapy. And um, it's structure-based, otherwise I wouldn't be here. So lunch is looming, you're all hungry. I will uh, give you in my talk the main results in the first two slides, that's this one and the next one. And then you can uh, dip away or you can listen carefully on how we actually got this. So um, when you have uh, cancer, then one big problem is that cancer cells can become resistant to the chemotherapy. So they simply adapt because the uh, doses that they were exposed to were sublethal and that means they can somehow learn to, uh, to evade the, um, the negative effects of the chemotherapy. And um, what you see here in this plot is a, a cell line, multiple myeloma, and uh, on day 10, uh, there were, well, I think I have to stand like this, there were uh, 100,000 cells. And now what of course should happen in a chemotherapy is that the chemo works and the cells all die and nothing is left, but these cells were specifically created to be resistant and that means they happily grow to uh, about 350,000 uh, uh, cells. But this compound RD1, which we discovered from purely publicly available structural data, uh, if you combine that with the chemotherapy with botetamib, it leads to a very, very significant uh, reduction in the cell count. And uh, RD1 is a compound uh, that is actually, you know, as such, not approved on the market. Uh, 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 there was just, you know, a few papers on the base of RD1 um, that were available. But drug repositioning is, of course, in particular interesting if the drugs are already on the market, and that means there is a lot of information on their side effects, their toxicity, um, and so on. And that is basically the really helpful thing to maybe uh, 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 speed up and reduce the cost of, of getting the new indication approved. And here is a second uh, example where we followed a different structural bioinformatics approach um, and focused specifically on, on FDA approved drugs. And that brought up a malaria drug that is currently on the market and is being sold. And you see again, you know, 100,000 cells and just the standard chemotherapy, the cells continue to grow. Here it's from day 12 to day 19. And if you uh, combine it with a malaria drug, then you see it uh, essentially comes to, comes to a halt. Okay, so um, yeah, I must say I'm, I'm really excited about these uh, results. This is uh, wet lab work. This was for me a very, very long journey because I'm a computer scientist originally. I don't really have a wet lab. Um, but, you know, I've got a, over five years now biologist, biologist in the group who is doing all of these, uh, 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 these experiments. Um, and the key thing is, of course, you know, how did we get those compounds? Because that is also important. Um, there is no way that anybody working in this who is coming, who is approaching it from a kind of medicine point of view or biology point of view, would have come up with these compounds. That was really only possible through taking some turns through some structural data that we analyzed. So let, let's start slowly with, with uh, kind of making clear how these experiments work to, to prove that these drugs are doing something. So here I just put a slide uh, that I took from, from, from the internet that shows you some, some cells. So uh, Jörg Heinrich, the biologist in the group, so that's what he's doing. He's uh, having a Petri dish with these cell cultures and then he has to count uh, uh, the cells, extrapolating and uh, uh, normalizing so that we have our cell, cell count starting at, at, at 100,000. And then you give the chemotherapy, and the chemotherapy should, of course, kill all of these cells. And as I said, I stole this. Drug resistance is a big problem. I stole this because that's actually a, a picture that is uh, about antibiotic drug resistant, but of course, kind of the similar problems you, uh, you face for cancer cells. So, and what does normally happen? If you, um, if you have your 100,000 cancer cells, 
and you expose them to 0.4 nanograms per milliliter of uh, bortezomib, the chemotherapy, which is a high dose, then essentially all the cells uh, just die. This is really how it should be working. But then what you can do is, uh, well, you expose them to 0.4 and voila, they continue to grow to 300,000. So what has happened? Obviously, these cells must be different from those cells. And the differences you see here, this is day zero, this is day 10. What uh, happened here is that these cells were slowly um, kind of exposed to the chemotherapy starting from lower doses. So on day zero, they only got 0.2 nanograms uh, per milliliter. So they got the low dose, grew to 400,000, then were reduced back to, uh, to 100,000 on day four, and were then exposed to a slightly higher uh, dose of the chemotherapy of 0.3. Starting from 100,000, at day 10, they grow to 500,000, and then basically at day 10, starting again from 100,000, you have, I think it's at day 19, uh, 300,000. So we have artificially created uh, uh, these resistant cells, but generally, kind of uh, uh, drug resistance is a, is, a, is a big problem. So whenever chemotherapy is not working, one of the reasons you know, can be that, that the cells have become resistant. So the big question for us is, uh, we have this uh, essay, the general problem in cancer therapy exists, so how can we resensitize uh, the cells? And that's where the drug repositioning comes in. And uh, that was already nicely pointed out in the introduction. Uh, uh, they are the famous examples, Viagra that was uh, tested for, uh, uh, for heart disease initially. Uh, there are other ones, for example, a standard chemotherapy that is uh, used, for example, in, in, in pancreas cancer, frequently in schemcitabine. Uh, that was actually originally tested as an antiviral before it came onto the market as antiviral. When the kind of lab experiments took place, it was found that it would be actually uh, much better as a chemotherapy. And so this is frequently happening, and uh, you can find studies that assess kind of what the uh, pharma industry is doing there, and you see that there are really now already a handful of uh, drugs that were repositioned on the market that create uh, multi-billion uh, revenues and that were, in a sense, yeah, much cheaper to, uh, to generate. But what a key problem to all of this uh, drug repositioning is that most of these drugs that are today already uh, on the market, they were found by serendipity. So it just happened uh, by chance. And that is actually also the starting point to the journey that, that we took uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and here the starting point is a herpes medication called Zostex um, that was found, that was, um, found or that was introduced as herpes treatment in the mid 80s onto the market. And after a few years, uh, it was uh, considered that it's uh, really, really a good drug, has little side effects, and uh, was then decided to be given to cancer patients who were suffering from, from herpes. Uh, and the hope was that the side effects were so little um, that this would not negatively affect the, the cancer progression. Uh, but what apparently one found is that it seemed to be positively uh, affecting it. And um, then came some cl clinical trials, or, or maybe let me first show this. So um, this herpes drug is working kind of exactly the same way as the drugs that we uh, derived uh, later, later on. And you can, you can see this nicely in this, uh, uh, when we apply it to the assay in the multiple myeloma cell lines. And uh, you can see exactly the same, so 100,000 on day 10, and it's not that significantly uh, reduced or, or even brought back to zero, but you see in comparison to the treatment with the chemotherapy on its own, this herpes drug is, uh, uh, is doing a very, very good job. And um, that was basically the basis, or not this experiment, but the general knowledge that, uh, that it is tackling resistance uh, was the basis for clinical trials that took place. So the first clinical trial was in the mid-90s, um, and that turned out to be negative. So it was really that patients prematurely died. The scientists who work on it didn't publish any more after that on, uh, on a ca any cancer application. Uh, and that was kind of burned, uh, completely burned ground. And you can see that even still today. So this is the box of this herpes medication as you can buy it in Germany. And it actually says in, in large red letters, do not use this together with chemotherapy. 
so really bad. However, if you look a bit closer, it's not as bad. This is specifically about one uh, uh, cytotoxic agent called 5-FU, uh, where these complications in this uh, experiment in the mid-90s uh, appeared. And later on, another group decided uh, with different chemotherapy, it will still work because it's not about this agent 5-FU, it's a general mechanism. Um, they continued, did also clinical trials a few years ago um, that was not uh, so bad, but it was also not good enough that uh, the FDA would have uh, allowed to proceed uh, towards approval of, um, of BVD. There were some mixed results. So basically, um, I'm just telling you all of this to uh, motivate you that we have to go beyond uh, BVDU. We have to do something different. And we want to have really different scaffolds because BVDU is, is a little bit kind of burnt ground. There were uh, negative results. And at the same time, we also want to be able to maybe uh, be a little bit more, more effective and have uh, uh, better properties. So... How to start this and, and how to connect it to structural bioinformatics? Um, and there, basically, the analysis of how drugs bind to targets uh, come in, comes into play. And that is essentially uh, that drugs are promiscuous. They have many targets. It's not that one drug binds one target uh, and has one effect, uh, that's it. But instead, it's the case that there are many targets. And uh, this is, in a sense, of course, not new to this community that uh, this should be mostly driven by the binding sites uh, that maybe different targets share and that explain why the ligand can, can uh, bind these different targets. But when you look at the, um, but when you, uh, look at the pharmaceutical literature where the focus is much stronger on the ligands themselves and where people work on libraries of millions of, uh, uh, of ligands, um, there you find many papers that focused entirely on properties of the ligands, like you know, how flexible the ligand is, how large the ligand is, its weight, its hydrophobicity. Um, and we once did a study uh, where we could nicely show if um, we limit ourselves to structural data from the PDB, I think it was about 165 compounds, which all had more than three different targets in the PDB. Um, then we found that none of these ligand properties really correlated nicely with, um, with the kind of the, the promiscuity of the drugs, whereas the number of shared binding sites was a very, very strong signal. And that's kind of what you see here, the number of targets and the number of uh, uh, similar binding sites. This plot is not uh, that easy because you can argue what it makes really a different target. Are two targets different if they 95% uh, uh, sequence dissimilar or does it have to be 30% uh, maximum that they're really different uh, superfamilies even um, and so on. But by and large, you get the picture that there is a connection. And um, then the question is, how does that relate to BVDU? So what would be the target of BVDU in herpes? What would be the target in cancer? And, and would they have a shared binding site? And then we did a lot of work in, um, or we were lucky that the PDB did have quite a bit of information on a target in, in uh, a herpes. Um, that was basically a herpes thymidine kinase, which uh, uh, would be phosphorylating the drug BVDU, so three phosphorus uh, group would be attached. Um, and the structure for that was there, and that meant we also had solid information of what that binding site was be, uh, would be looking like. Um, for the relevant cancer target, this was not true. So uh, experimentally, it was found out that the heat shock protein HSP27 is the relevant player for, uh, for cancer. Uh, and we built a model. So you see, again, the connection to yesterday's talk, uh, fragment-based uh, structure prediction, any structure prediction modeling is for us very important because for this HSP27, there was no structure available. We took something from uh, uh, public servers, refined it a bit, uh, and we're lucky that we found uh, a binding site that looks pretty similar to the uh, thymidine kinase one. And here's a little animation that Sebastian Salentin and the group created um, that shows you this. So this is the, uh, um, the uh, human heat shock protein, HSP27. And you can spot an, an area which um, you know, has two specific phenylalanine rings uh, sitting there. And when you now look into the viral protein, into the uh, thymidine kinase, um, it has a known binding site to BVDU, 
And if one highlights this binding site and looks at the specific residues that are involved, then one sees there are also these uh, two phenylalanines and the corresponding rings. And if you now take the two proteins and superimpose them, not globally, but simply based on the known binding site and the candidate binding site, then you see that there is really very, very beautiful um, agreement between the two. And yeah, so just, just shown again. So globally, those two proteins have really absolutely nothing at all to do with each other. There's no distant evolutionary relationship or so. It's really just uh, that it appears that that binding side is uh, somehow, you know, by chance uh, shared between them. So now the question is, how can we exploit this knowledge to go beyond uh, BVDU? So if you're kind of in a classical pharmaceutical setup, you would maybe consider to run a large uh, screen. You know, you have your one million compounds and you would say, okay, HSP27 is our target. Let's test all of these compounds against that target. Um, and that is a strategy that is, I think, used, uh, pursued for many years uh, in the pharmaceutical industry with kind of mixed, uh, mixed results. It's uh, time intensive and it's cost intensive. Uh, we could take a maybe more kind of small and narrowed uh, approach and just do a bit of medicinal chemistry. That means have a good chemist who looks at uh, the BVU, the herpes drug, and says, okay, let's do these and that refinements. That was not good, good enough for us because we said BVDU is burnt ground. We really want to have something uh, different. Um, and also all of those compounds uh, would have been patented so that they could not have been pursued uh, further. So that's where we said, okay, structural bioinformatics to the rescue. We want to implement scaffold hopping where we start off with BVDU and we hop through target space and we hop through the uh, ligand space to get to completely new and different ligands from the original uh, BVDU. So our goal was to find compounds which look different from BVDU, but uh, which behave in the same manner. And we developed uh, over the years two approaches. So one, I somehow labeled uh, that it's target hopping by function. And the second approach is target hopping by interaction. And what that means, I'll, I'll explain in a minute. So um, for the first approach, we somehow defined uh, a focused compound library by hopping from our original target, the viral thymidine kinase, the herpes thymidine kinase. Um, but we actually did this target, target hopping in a very, very narrow manner. We simply hopped to other thymidine kinases, other viral thymidine kinases, non-viral thymidine kinases. But it was a form of very simple target hopping um, by function, namely being a thymidine kinase, um, and then collecting a library of compounds from which we would start. We rank those compounds with docking and validate them with the assays that you've seen in the beginning in, in, in vitro, plus a few uh, functional assays and binding assays, which I will not go uh, into here. So again, um, we did not take a library of all compounds. We could have done that, of course. You know, why not take the whole of PubChem um, or the whole of all FDA-approved drugs uh, and run those docking screens? Well, and we've seen it. Um, docking is not yet a solved problem. And the correlation um, of affinity scores that are predicted with docking algorithms and the really measured affinity scores is uh, 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 it's not perfect. Um, hence, when you do such large-scale docking experiments and you start with a very big library, uh, you will have a problem of, of a lot of noise. So therefore, that's not a good, good point. Well, so then you could say, okay, let's make the library small then. Um, and uh, well, you could say, let's make the library validated HSP27 inhibitors. But then the answer is actually, there is no validated HSP27 inhibitor. So that library was, was too small. So, and of course, I have to say that because uh, the way we defined our library was just right. Uh, we took 228 compounds, which, as I said, derived from this target hopping by additionally, besides the original uh, herpes thymidine kinase, considering other thymidine kinases that we found in the PDB. So their pictures are shown over there. 
Um, but then we didn't limit ourselves to PDB. We uh, went into uh, binding DB and looked in, in, into other databases and simply said, anything that can bind these thymidine kinases, we want to have in our library uh, for further processing. So we then simply ran off the shelf, you know, no uh, uh, um, kind of additional algorithm development, um, uh, docking experiments with, with autodoc, and we said, okay, we want to have compounds that are better than BVDU in both of the uh, binding sites. And we insisted on both because the thymidine kinase binding site is, of course, not the one that we were really after, but that was the one where the structure was known. And the uh, HSP27 binding site, because that was the one we were after, but there it was a model that we have developed, and it's clear that it's very unlikely that that model as a whole is really true. The model or the part of the binding site is likely to be uh, true because it was experimentally validated when mutating key residues in that binding site, um, then the drugs don't bind anymore. And this was the result. So um, the 29 compounds that you see over here, which you know turned out to be better than BVDU, uh, we analyzed and we compared them pairwise against each other. So we uh, we took kind of you know standard uh, methods provided by by, by PubChem for comparing uh, uh, chemical compounds by fingerprints and getting a Tanimoto score where basically zero or in the heat map uh, uh, white and yellow means not very similar and the more red it is the uh, more similar it becomes and then of course what you see is also among those 29 compounds you see uh, groups of, of related compounds so you see for example here BVDU and uh, this group of compounds you know would be uh, very direct uh, derivatives of BVDU and that means for example they would all be patented and, and it could be expected um, that they behave uh, very differently. But we also find uh, compounds, and uh, this RD1 was actually the best one from, from the docking, which are, in terms of structure, uh, very distant. And uh, there is also, with this analysis, something really interesting because um, kind of you cannot really see this in this heat map, but when you look at the structures in detail, you can see that there's really a pathway going on how these compounds uh, get bit by bit modified and chart, in a sense, a space uh, that is uh, covering all of those drugs um, that possibly bind HSP27. And uh, we started doing this when our medicinal chemist uh, looked at this and said, yeah, such a heat map, the management likes seeing these things, I want to see the structures. And um, yeah, let me uh, show this. And this is what we did then. And uh, no need to, to dig into detail what this is, but they were essentially kind of four groups of compounds that were really, really distant, so there was no connection to BVDU. But the other compounds in the heat map, you could organize a, a little bit that you could see a transition. And that was essentially this path over here from direct BVDU derivatives to some thymine derivatives. And uh, what you could, could see there is that in these BVDU derivatives, there were some modifications here at, uh, at this positions. And then in the group, these were kind of intermediate sitting between these two groups. So they were still very similar to those three, but also similar to these six. And you could see all of that was preserved. And here were some further modifications. But then the real interesting thing came because uh, with BVDU, it was always said originally that this brome uh, is playing a key role in, in the binding. And here we see for the first time, no, hang on. Now we have the migration from this scaffold to over here and the, that group is gone. Uh, so apparently you can have the effect uh, without that. And then it got really interesting when we got here because this group is gone and this group is also gone. So there's only the thymine scaffold left and there are different linkers here and different, completely different, uh, different end groups. And that is so exciting because no medicinal chemist who would have started out from here could have made the transitions to the compounds which comprise our best compound, RD1, uh, that could not have been made by, by looking at the, um, at the uh, structures of those compounds. Yeah, and uh, I quickly skipped over that, but just to repeat, uh, this has worked. You know, this approach has worked. It gave us something that uh, you could not have derived directly from, PD, uh, uh, from looking at BVDU. 
uh, experimentally in cell culture, this is effective. And now the next step for us is to test this in, in, in mice. The experiments will still start um, this year. And we got the funding for, uh, for that. So we're hopeful that we can further develop this and bring it a step closer to maybe having an impact uh, really for improving the chemotherapy on patients. Um, however, we took this also as a starting point to say, well, well, in a sense, you know, that was pretty direct. You know, we started with a viral thymidine kinase, took other thymidine kinases. Uh, can't we do better and be much, much, much more distant? And this is the second approach, which is uh, kind of unpublished uh, um, work, which we kind of just finished now. Um, and I call that target hopping by interaction. And the idea was that we study in detail how BVDU is actually interacting with its target and that we then forget about BVDU, we forget about these targets and we just concentrate on the, uh, on the interaction. And the key resource uh, to do this is, is uh, uh, PLIP, which uh, Sebastian in the group and Melissa also uh, have developed and which is uh, really also by the community widely used. We, we have now for two years about 12,000 uh, users and, and already many people uh, cited. So we're really uh, happy. And, and PLIP uh, does something very basic. It has uh, a set of kind of standard interactions uh, uh, defined, hydrogen bonds, halogen interactions, uh, uh, and so on. And you can provide your PDB ID or upload your structure, and it gives you a detailed uh, analysis of what the interactions are like. Uh, it gives you PyMol session files and uh, um, gives you also nice visualizations that you can use for your paper, maybe to show some, some specific result. So basically what we did was we applied those um, uh, uh, PLIP analysis to the whole of PDB and uh, compared that to interaction patterns which we had defined using PLIP from known interactions of BVDU to, to uh, targets. And um, that was essentially uh, or symbolized like, like this. So here we have BVDU, here we have one specific interactions and these were all the templates that we had available from the, uh, from the PDB. And what you could see is that there were some very specific patterns. So there's this ring and this is uh, held in a kind of pie stacking um, uh, by, by these two rings uh, over here. And this seems to be something very fundamental to this interaction. And it's interesting how these patterns also lead to an emerging specificity of interaction. Because generally, uh, when you quantify that over the whole PDB, which we were able to do with PLIP, uh, then you find that pi stacking is very, very frequent. So about 25%, if I remember correctly, of all interactions that we have charted across the whole PDB, every single structure is pi stacking. So you would argue this is highly unspecific and uh, is not, not really important. However, if you then say, well, I want to have a double pi stacking and it must be kind of a sandwich-like uh, pi stacking where you know this, this ring is uh, uh, sitting in the middle and I set certain constraints also on the angles that are allowed, it becomes very specific. So for example, this arrangement here, you find only in 0.5% of all the interactions that are in the PDB. Uh, so basically by combining several patterns together, um, then of course you become very uh, specific. And we have defined overall, yeah, here, you, here you see that, yeah, so basically we, we impose uh, constraints on the, on the angles, we insist that uh, the rings you know, should be in parallel. And that way, we define overall 10 patterns that are characteristic of uh, BVDU interacting with, uh, uh, with its target. So here, for example, two parallel hydrogen bonds. Here, this, this halogen bond, uh, uh, hydrophobic contact, and so on. Now, obviously, uh, structures are flexible. Uh, not necessarily, um, you know, the drug has to interact in exactly the same way with all of its targets. And that means um, that you will not have perfect agreement in the usage of these patterns across uh, all of the targets. So here you see the PDB structures, um, the, uh, the targets, and, and here you see the, 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 the 10 patterns. And you see that basically, you know, there, there are some structures. So here are basically the herpes uh, uh, structures that really you know, have uh, uh, nearly all of the patterns, uh, but you see also that there is uh, not really a perfect agreement. And that's very important because it meant for us, if we go and screen, we should not be expecting um, that we can single out just, you know, those uh, 
uh, ligands you know, that interact or that satisfy all of these 10 patterns, but that we have to be uh, uh, considering this in a, gradual, in a gradual manner. And this is what the result is looking like. So uh, if we really insist on 10 patterns that need to be matched, uh, we don't have a single example. Uh, if we insist on nine, uh, we have a handful, and this includes uh, uh, two, two approved uh, uh, drugs. Um, and it was also a nice control because BVDU is a, a, a thymidine analog, and actually thymidine is there with, uh, with, with nine uh, of the patterns satisfied. If you go to the other extreme and you see uh, here just two of the patterns of the 10 patterns satisfied, that is, of course, highly uh, unspecific and probably uh, not really meaningful at all. You end up at about uh, 4,000 something overall compounds, which included about 500 uh, um, drugs that were either in experimental status or already, um, already approved. So for us, it was clear that here somewhere in the middle, that's probably where it's interesting because also here in the top, it's likely that these will be very closely uh, uh, related compounds to, uh, to BVDU. So again, we, um, took a, whoops, we took a cutoff. We took a cutoff here and said over five uh, patterns have to, be, uh, have to be satisfied, which gave us about, I think, 250 compounds, including 58 drugs, including, I think, 12 FDA-approved uh, drugs that, that are on the market. And again, we could uh, do the comparison of how similar those compounds are in structure, and we get a similar heat map out that shows us, essentially, here is a group of compounds that is very closely related to BVDU. So we would argue this is not interesting. We want new scaffolds. These are also still quite close related uh, to BVDU. But here in this area, it's, uh, um, it's, it's, getting, it's getting interesting. And the one that, uh, or, or two compounds that uh, stroke us, um, one is an ingredient of, uh, uh, of honey, which we uh, also validated, and it was positive, um, but we also got some, some negative feedback that said, look, this is a frequent hitter. Uh, this will never be of any practical inter uh, interest, even if your experiments you know, worked on it. Um, but, but after that, uh, we basically said, okay, let's, let's focus on the more realistic ones and the FDA-approved ones. And uh, that gave us this RD2, um, which is actually an approved uh, malaria drug that, that is on the, on the market today. And here you can see what it's looking like, what these patterns are doing. So this is BVDU binding to its uh, viral thymidine kinase, so the parallel pi stacking here the uh, parallel uh, uh, hydrogen bonds over there, um, here the uh, halogen contact. And this is how um, the malaria drug is binding to a malaria target. The malaria target has absolutely nothing to do with the herpes target. It has nothing to do with the cancer target. It's a completely different thing. And yet you see, okay, the ring structure, here are the two rings, you know, that looks nice, this is here. The distal hydrophobic contact is here. And you can also see this contact over there is not present, but you can see nicely if you would run a little simulation, you would also get, uh, uh, get a hydrogen bond over there in this position and would even be, uh, even be better. So the beauty of this method is also that although we're stepping really so far out into a completely different direction, you can look at these results and uh, say, well, that looks actually close enough to me that I'm willing to invest the, the, uh, the money and time that is necessary to uh, experimentally validate it. And that is kind of the second finding that we, uh, that we got and that I showed you already. So this is you know, our malaria drug, RD2, and you see it also has a very, very pronounced um, effect uh, uh, in this multiple myeloma cell line. So that means it works also in vitro. Yeah, so basically, that brings me to the, to the end of the talk. Uh, drug pre repositioning with structure works. There are, of course, many, many different ways how one can approach uh, drug repositioning. This is uh, only, only one, but it's uh, one where the beauty is that you can get very detailed inside, which uh, I think can give uh, very good explanation and evidence uh, for subsequent uh, experiments, which you need, because they are, of course, uh, lengthy. So our next step is uh, validation in, in, in mouse.
And I think uh, that's very important. We really believe that this uh, mechanism of HSP27 inhibition for which we have the compounds is general. So multiple myeloma cell lines we only took because uh, it was documented in literature that the assays work, that HSP27 is, is highly expressed in these cell lines. Uh, but that's actually the case in many cancers. Uh, so in breast cancer, pancreas cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, in all of these cancers, HSP27 is, is highly um, expressed. The only one where HSP27 is not, highly, uh, not so highly expressed is testis cancer. And that's also one of the few cancers where chemotherapy does not really have such a big problem uh, with uh, developing resistance of the, of the cancer cells. So we really believe that it's a general mechanism and our mouse experiments we will do in lung cancer and, and, and in uh, colon cancer. And the, uh, for RD1, we also have the in vitro results that show also in these cell lines um, that this is uh, working. But the other big thing is, of course, um, is this like a lucky, you know, one-off shot where structural bioinformatics could help specifically uh, for BVDU, or can we really show uh, that this is a general approach and that you could apply it to other drugs, to other targets, uh, um, to other diseases? And there, of course, we are limited uh, by PDB, by the kind of structural data that is available, by the diseases um, that are uh, uh, covered. But we are very optimistic that we find uh, uh, interesting stuff here. And then on a last note, um, for me, it was also exciting to listen to talks yesterday and today because there are many, many connections which we want to also exploit in our, in our future work, how to take this forward. So, for example, the work on uh, uh, EM maps, uh, I checked yesterday during the talk. Unfortunately, the database does not have uh, HSP27. That would be really nice uh, and it would be great uh, to do that because it is not yet fully understood how HSP27 really works with its anti-cancer effect. So HSP27 is a chaperone, so it helps other proteins to, uh, to fold. Um, and there is some evidence that the oligomers for the chaperone activity are larger um, than the number of, of monomers that integrate when it uh, shows this uh, apoptotic. Um, effect. And uh, there would be lovely to get an EM map and try to build a larger complex um, uh, of this oligomerization and to see also where the binding sites of our drugs are in relation to this, uh, to this larger, uh, larger complex. Well, then, of course, the text mining is important, and that's, you know, also uh, deep at my heart because I, I did a lot of uh, uh, text mining. Um, that, of course, you need su uh, supplementary evidence, you know, that you want to go to papers, to patents, uh, and especially also to electronic health records. You know, how great would it be if we could just look up and say, oh, you know, are there any patients who are suffering from herpes, get this medication, and they also suffer from cancer? And maybe we see a slight statistical effect uh, that would be, again, good evidence that you could bring forward when you try to convince medical doctors to maybe look... Uh, um, uh, to look deeper into it. And then the third thing that is, I think, really important for this work, um, we worked here on the model of HSP27, and for uh, the initial work, this was very important. For the second approach, it was, in a sense, not really important that we had the model. Uh, but the key thing is, uh, I once spoke uh, to uh, Christine Slingsby in London, who is a retired professor, and, and she worked for 30 years on trying to solve the structure of HSP27. Uh, and, and, and she said, forget what you have in the model. You know, it will, not be, uh, it will not be right. She actually believes that that part where the binding site is does not have a defined uh, structure. Um, and I think that's an, uh, maybe an interesting uh, 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 view onto this uh, structure prediction work also. For us, that was not really so important because we were only after the binding site, and the binding site we validated experimentally. Um, and I think that's maybe an interesting way of looking at structure prediction where you get constraints that come from a practical application that say, well, we don't really care whether your methods are good enough to get everything right as long as you give us good hints on, for example, things like the binding side and as long as we have other ways of validating whether this prediction uh, could be good. So uh, that's also very interesting for us and we will uh, basically make, make use of all of this work when we try to do... Uh, these algorithms at larger scale. Yeah, so the, with this, thanks really to uh, a lot of great people who made this work uh, happen. So there is uh, Sebastian Zalantin who developed PLIP and uh, that is really the base for 
uh, the second approach, and Melissa defined the patterns. That is, of course, also, if you will, still a weakness of the approach because uh, the success that we have is due to the intelligent definition of patterns, and we're now in the process of uh, trying to automate this uh, to, to, to some degree. So thanks to, to Melissa for that. Jörg Heinrich is doing the wet lab experiments. Uh, Gary is uh, having now a pharma point of view and is guiding us there in strategy. Negin just joined recently. And there are some former group members who uh, created really the base for all of this work and experimental collaborators whose labs we're using, medicinal chemistry, and uh, a physician with whom we will exploit this in, uh, um, in colon cancer. And with this, let me conclude. We have an open position in Dresden, so if anybody is interested to work on these things, please uh, get in touch with me. Thank you for an excellent talk. Actually, two thanks, thank yous also for, in the last part, uh, giving your insight and integrating between different talks which are relevant here. Uh, before I move to questions, I want to remind the session chairs, keynotes, and senior PIs to receive your recommendations for the best talks that will get an award at the end of the closing remarks today. Questions, please. Thank you for the excellent talk. I, I have a question. Is there anything in your mind to be gained by looking in, in the interaction or some uh, in, in the connection between the original drug for which you want to, to show the resist? Um, you know that there is res resistant and your you know co-drug. Co At least uh, you have to make sure that they don't interact via the same binding site. Otherwise, they will be competing and you don't gain the... I guess you will not gain the effect that you are seeing. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's actually uh, an interesting concept, and you may wonder, you know, is that really a synergy between those two, two, two drugs that is happening because they really do something on the same pathways uh, um, and so on? And uh, both in cancer and in uh, antibiotic resistance uh, development, there is this uh, concept of uh, collateral sensitivity that maybe, you know, if you give a set second drug, it resensitizes uh, to the first drug, and um, and, and and basically uh, 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 it, it, it re-establishes it. But we find we did not find um, uh, uh, this happening over here for for um, you know for RD1 for for those drugs. Thank you, Juan Ungo, for your question. Please present yourself before asking. Uh, uh, hello, thanks for inspiring talk. I think this um, shows really how structural bioinformatics uh, is powerful in discovering new insights. And I think in your second approach, so what you presented, the key ingredient of the success were the uh, interactions that you have identified. And as you mentioned at, at the end, it was probably uh, with the help of um, an expert intervention. Uh, so what are your ideas of how one could scale this up and to make it automatic. So what would be your approaches to, to, to make this a universal tool? Yeah, so I mean, that, that is of course our, our goal. And I mean, after all, we're computer scientists. That means we want to have uh, uh, as little human intervention um, as, is, uh, uh, as is possible. And um, one way is simply that in a, in a, in a similar manner as you uh, have now fingerprints that are used, for example, to search uh, you know, chemicals on, on, on PubChem, um, that you define fingerprints uh, uh, that are based on these interaction patterns and that you define many features and instead of limiting maybe yourself to, to just you know, a narrow uh, uh, kind of bandwidth of angles that you consider how these features relate uh, to each other that you simply explore their you know, many, many different combinations. And in a sense, uh, what you do is, again, you create a fingerprint that is only slightly differently defined because it's not a fingerprint from the chemical, but it's a fingerprint of the interaction. And then you're again in the area where you have a long binary vector and where you can apply search technology and ranking and similarity uh, measures and hence have it fully, uh, uh, fully automated. And that's the approach and direction we will take in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, so the question is, for the docking part, you used Afterdoc, uh, but have you tried using Afterdoc Vina 
Uh, no, I mean, as I said, we really took off the shelf and also we didn't really want to go into the direction of uh, uh, saying, okay, is this tool better than that? Or we optimize or we maybe even ourselves modify the algorithm for this specific docking setup that we, uh, that, that we exploit knowledge. Um, because actually, to be honest, uh, my real goal is that we don't want to do any docking at all. Uh, in the second approach, we also did a little bit docking when we looked at the FDA approved uh, uh, drugs, but we had also other filters. And, and the reason why is that I believe it's still not really good enough. You know, when you look at the correlation of the scores, and, and this is not about maybe one specific tool being better than the, uh, than the other, it's, uh, it's not perfect. And in a sense, also our decision to say, we take everything that is better than BVDU in terms of the orthodox scores is a little bit a critical one. You could have said, well, you know, those that are 10% worse, you know, in the wet lab, they may turn out to be, be, be good as well. Um, so I don't really want to go into that direction that, 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 that I optimize. Um, but, but I don't know if uh, maybe in coffee break you can convince me that, that the results will reorder and much better if we do it differently and I would be happy to exploit that as well, of course. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last question, Mary Jo. Uh, thank you. That was a very exciting talk. Uh, I'm Mary Jo Andrikin. Uh, I'm curious about the mechanism of action of RD1 and RD2. Do they have inhibitory effect on the wild type target or do they inhibit the mutated resistant form of the target? Um, it's not that the target becomes mutated, although honestly, uh, of course, it's a good question. We don't really know that, but we don't believe that this is about kind of mutations that get accumulated in the, uh, in the seed shock protein uh, that lead to the difference. So we have always worked on the wild type uh, HSP27 target and the resistance that emerges is on the cel cellular level and how this resistance emerges and how this resistance uh, is reflected in, in mutations that get accumulated uh, we don't know so that would be actually very interesting also connecting to the uh, invited talk this this morning if we had deep sequencing information on the um, uh, uh, on the resistance cell line versus the original cell line that would of course be very interesting also to, uh, 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 to elaborate and specifically to look whether our HSP27 is affected. But I personally believe that, that this is not the case. Thank you, Michael, for an excellent talk, which is important not only for drug repositioning, but also for specificity, where the lack of specificity often kills drugs in clinical trials. So I really thank you and thank all the excellent talks of this session. Thank you.